The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle? all day. They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, Each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat." But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you, brothers and sisters, from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, the parables that Jesus tells are often people's favorite parts of the New Testament. And I'm guessing that's because so much of the time the parables give us characters and stories that we love and that we can often relate to. Think of the Good Samaritan, for example. People love the Good Samaritan. The story certainly challenges us, but it also leaves us with a nice, warm feeling at the end. The stranger that everyone is supposed to hate and have low expectations for turns out to be the hero of the story. Hooray! People also love the parable of the prodigal son. I preached on that one not too long ago. You know, that's the one where the no-good, ne'er-do-well son asks for his inheritance early and goes off to squander every penny. But when he comes home to grovel before his father, surprise! He is graciously and joyfully welcomed back by his loving father who even throws 
a big party for him. The sun was lost, but now is found. A nice warm ending for sure. Even the parable that we heard last Sunday, the one Jesus tells in response to his disciples' questions about forgiveness, is kind of popular. It doesn't have a happy finish, but it really doesn't need one. The story makes sense, and justice is served. If you recall, this is the parable (coughs) where a slave is forgiven a big debt by his master, but then the slave turns around and rakes some other guy over the coals because he owes the slave just a pittance. What a jerk. Nobody wants that guy to win, and he doesn't. When word gets back to his master... He gets thrown in prison for being so unforgiving. And now we get to today's parable, which is everyone's all-time favorite, says nobody ever. It's pretty much a downer, isn't it? There are no characters in this story who win our hearts, and there's no sense of justice or fairness that emerges at the end. The people who have worked all day in the hot, sunny, sweaty vineyards make the same amount of money as those who've only worked for one hour. Where's the fairness in that? Now, I didn't really know about day laborers until I was an adult, and I was visiting my sister in Arizona. We were driving down a street in Phoenix one day, and I saw a group of men, mostly of Mexican descent, along with some indigenous people, standing around in a parking lot near the Home Depot store. My sister explained to me that these were men who were looking to be hired as day laborers for construction or landscaping jobs in the area. The youngest, healthiest-looking guys were hired earliest in the day, with the older, sometimes disabled men hired last, if at all. I was not around when the men came back on the truck and were paid, so I can't speak to the fairness of their pay, but I'm guessing that the ones who worked longest and were the most productive, logically made the most money. Well, not so in Jesus' parable, where things weren't fair as far as we would see it. Now, just a word about the economics of growing grapes and making wine in the first century. The vineyard owner in this parable is obviously a wealthy man. He has managers and many day laborers working on his behalf. Vineyards belonged to the wealthy of that day because they required a significant initial investment. It took four years of careful tending before a vineyard would bear fruit, but the payoff in the long run was well worth it. The day laborers, of course, are at the other end of the economic spectrum. Their work is precarious and unpredictable, and they were subject to hunger, disease, dependency, and when they weren't hired, they had to resort to begging. In a word, they were the expendable people in that society. Back to the, the, um, the parable, the manager of the vineyard actually went out at dawn to hire the first batch of workers, and then he went back to hire workers for the vineyard several times in the same day, at 9 a.m., at noon, at 3 p.m., and one final time at 5 p.m., 
Why did he keep going back to hire more workers? We really aren't told, are we? Maybe he underestimated the number of workers the first time around that were needed to harvest the grapes. Perhaps it was urgent to get the grapes picked before they spoiled. And it's a long shot, but maybe he wanted to give more people an opportunity to work in the vineyards. Who knows? We can only speculate. Fairness is a huge deal in our society, isn't it? Okay, what group of workers is out on strike right now for fair wages and health insurance and retirement benefits and other compensation factors? The auto workers. In every occupation, people want to make sure that they get their fair share of salary and benefits in comparison to other people, and I certainly understand that. Healthcare professionals, police officers, teachers, firefighters, and other workers do the same thing when they believe that it's necessary. But in the kingdom of heaven, things are different, aren't they? Jesus says that the last will be first and the first will be last. Well, that would never work in the United States in the 21st century, would it? We have to have things fair and equal, and Jesus' method would just mess everything up. But things aren't always fair and equal, even in our lives, are they? Let me ask you this, and I hope some of you will respond Have you ever had the experience of unexpected good fortune or what I would call unearned grace? Perhaps you were given something of value that you really hadn't earned or that you had received as a surprise. As I thought about that for myself, for me that has been this late in life, rather late in life, opportunity to become a pastor. Although, if I'm really honest, I'll have to say I did work for that. I did plenty of work for that. It didn't just drop in my life. But I still consider it to be a gift of God's grace. How about for you? Have any of you had a pure gift of grace that came to you without having earned it. Don't be shy. We're still here. We're still here. That's a good one. (laughs) Yes. The, 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 The grace of having a good long life, certainly, is a gift of grace that we probably haven't, haven't earned. I can see John Bolts thinking there in the back row. <laughs> Anything on your mind, John? <laughs> Yeah, wow, that's a, that's a powerful one. Um, and I hope you all were able to hear John talk about the, the gift of his successful open heart surgery less than two years ago now, wasn't it, John? That has restored him to health. And John is absolutely right. That would not have been possible 50 years ago um, when my father died of heart disease. So yes, that is something to be very grateful for. Can you think of any other examples? I'm mindful of a friend from this congregation who would prefer to remain nameless, but we stepped up in a time of need mm-hmm. when I was trying to buy my house. Ah, oh, okay. Wow. Another, a, another powerful example of 
unearned, an unearned gift of, of God's grace made possible through a human being who, I don't know, might even be sitting in this room. I don't know who that is, but what a blessing. What a blessing that is. Um, yeah, I think probably all of us can think of some point in our life where we were given some measure of God's grace um, that we absolutely did not merit. The greatest gift, unearned gift, that any of us has been given is the gift of God's Son, the gift of eternal life. And we receive that gift again and again every time we worship in the form of Holy Communion as we will receive it a little bit in in just a few minutes from now. We also receive this gift as we remember our baptism. When we became God's children, a totally unearned gift of God's grace. And as we remember these gifts, we are encouraged, even admonished in our second lesson today from Philippians. We are admonished to live a life worthy of God's grace by opening the world's eyes to the wonder of God's kingdom, which is coming near. Everyone, and I mean everyone, no exceptions, is promised God's goodness and grace, whether they are cradle Christians, as many of us are, or whether they maybe just now are coming to faith because they are learning about God's love for them. We want the whole world to know of this gift of grace. The paradox we encounter in this and all Jesus' gospel miracles is meant to open us up to a deeper understanding of who God is and who we are in relationship to God. On the surface, the scene that we've explored here in our gospel appears unfair, even unjust, as workers who come in at the 11th hour are paid the exact same thing as those who have worked all day. From a human standpoint, this scenario doesn't make much sense, but that's probably when we should realize that something deeper is unfolding here and that our ways are not God's ways. The word, let's face it, God cannot be outdone in generosity. God is generous in a way that far surpasses our best human standards of justice and fairness. Again, as the prophet Isaiah says to us, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. God's love is limitless in a way that we cannot begin to comprehend. So as we think about being disciples of our Lord Jesus. The word of God challenges us to make generosity and compassion a way of life rather than something we only do in times of crisis and turmoil. Scripture opens our hearts to God's deep and generous love poured out for us on the cross of his son, Jesus. And Jesus' cross serves as the model for how we treat others if we only open our hearts to the needs of other people. Each one of us has been forgiven and loved immeasurably beyond all human understanding and expectation. Knowing God's abundant generosity, I wonder, and I invite you to wonder with me, 
as we go forth from this place in a few minutes, can I really become a channel of God's love and grace to other people? And my answer to that is most assuredly so. In fact, our second lesson for today from Philippians exhorts us to live your life in a worthy in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Ponder this. How does Jesus' parable help us in understanding the immensity of God's love and mercy? In Jesus' gracious name we pray. Amen.